Okay, it's just gone 10, 12 minutes past. Um, we'll start on the second, uh, the second presentation for this afternoon. Uh, welcome to anybody who might have joined us in between. Um, we're just running slightly late, um, but I think we've made up some time. Um, so the second presentation this afternoon is from Dr. David Henderson, who many of you will be familiar with because he's the person that manages the seminars. But what many of you probably don't know is that he's also a historian um, who's very interested in oral history and and storytelling and getting perspectives from people that you don't usually hear from. Um, so he's going to talk this afternoon about a project called Stories from the Wild West Frontier, um, which, and it's going to, this is based on a book chapter that's forthcoming in a book about the NDIS. Um, and so it's just talking about two people, um, but he's uh, adding to that with a series of interviews from a whole range of other people uh, family members too. So I'm going to hand over to David who's going to do that and I'm going to control the slides. So you just tell me when we need to go. Okay, welcome David. Off you go. Thanks for that Chris. Um, what you didn't mention in that intro introduction was also that I'm the one uh, responsible for the monumental stuff up at the start of this uh, seminar. So I'm sorry about that, um, but we'll move right along. So if you could just move to the next slide, Chris. Um, so one afternoon in February 2019, the father of a person with intellectual disability spoke at this training session that my colleagues run about the challenges that he'd faced in supporting his daughter to make decisions over the years. And at one point in that conversation, in that training session, he talked about the NDIS and likened his own experiences of navigating the scheme to living on the American frontier in the 1860s. My mind always goes to the Wild West, he said, of his feelings about the NDIS, and of everything as being fairly lawless, but also this place of great opportunity. So this father acknowledged that not everything about the NDIS was perfect, and he also talked about how the NDIA often promised more than it could deliver. But he said that sometimes it was worth ignoring all of that and just pushing ahead with and taking advantage of how that regulatory framework was still evolving. I wasn't at that training session in 2019, but when I came across this quote, I was really struck by that metaphor of the NDIS, and it became something that I wanted to further explore. So what I wanna do in this presentation here is first talk about and understand something of the lives of people living on that wild west frontier of the NDIS. And more, more specifically, what I want to do is look at the personal stories of people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities and look at some of the experiences that they have encountered in their dealings with the scheme since it was first implemented across Australia in 2016. And if we just go to the next slide, uh, before I get in uh, right into the heart of the talk, I just wanted to share two paintings by an artist called um, Albert Bierstadt uh, that sort of touches on some of those issues that that father was talking about. So on the left hand side, we have this image called Cowboys and Indians. And I don't want to go into the racial undertones of this uh, image, but it captures that first element that that father was talking about, the NDIS, as this unwieldy, lawless, lack of regulation sort of uh, scheme. But then on the other hand, we've got this other image which shows the Wild West as a real a place of opportunity, this land of opportunity and freedom. And if we just hold on to those two elements, those of the NDIS or those two images as we move through this talk, it might help us carry that, um, that metaphor forward. So if we just go to the next slide. Um, I don't think we need to talk too much about what the NDIS is and what it does, but I did want to just touch on some of the key elements of the scheme. And it's the, the NDIS it is a new era of disability service delivery. It's this historical shift in allocation principles uh, and, and the scheme is expected to favorably influence, influence the health and the wealth, well-being and the lives of many people with disability in Australia. And we know about the actuarial model and how the principle of reasonable and necessary disability support under, underpins the scheme's objective to pr provide lifelong individualized support to people with disabilities. And all of these elements should be celebrated. And I guess just by exploring the personal stories of two participants who have 
accessed and navigated the NDIS, this presentation just starts to ask that question whether or not the scheme is really living up to those celebrated ideals. And if we could just go to the next slide. Um, so one of the aims of the NDIS is to shift authority over disability service design and direction from service provider to service user. And by prioritizing the stories of NDIS participants, this presentation is trying to emulate something of that shift in authority. And it's most commonly people with physical or sensory disabilities who act as the public voice of disability advocacy. And even when that advocacy is more nuanced, there's still this tendency for people with mild intellectual disabilities to act as almost as proxies for pe all people with uh, intellectual disabilities. But unless others begin to represent people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities, then both in public arenas of advocacy, but also in the private transactions with, ND with the NDIS, these stories are liable to go unnoticed and ignored. And so what I really wanted to do today was just start to insert people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities into, narrative, into public narratives about the NDIS. And this leads to further questions about how, or even if we can garner the experiences or perspectives of what might be considered a voiceless or a marginalized population. And it's not a question that's easily resolved. And there's this great quote by a historian called John Ar Arnold that touches on some of these issues. And he talks about uh, how there is little more seductive than the promise of access to voices of those normally absent from the historical record. And then he goes on to talk about how communicating those views is never a straightforward process. And of course, for us, this process, this task is made even more difficult because the cohort whose experiences we're trying to represent here don't use words to communicate. Um, our own approach to resolving this issue was to use life review interviews with parents of children with, with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. And it's this methodology that draws on overlapping techniques of, of oral history on the one hand and life story interviews on the other. And one of the aims of the interviews was to really facilitate informants of the study to talk in as much detail as possible about their own and by extension their child's experience of the NDIS, but also just talk about some of the routines of their daily lives and how these have changed over time. So the interviews focused on an individual's experience prior to, during and after the implementation of the NDIS. And this is the way that we've sought to excavate the experiences of people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. And I'm not going to pretend that this is the perfect approach or the only approach, but I would argue that it's better to use an imperfect approach than to not try at all. And so this presentation is based on a chapter that I've already written. That's what Chris uh, just uh, mentioned now. And the chapter really goes into a lot of a detail about individual. Essentially what the chapter tries to do is to let each individual tell their own story in their own words. And that's not really possible to do here. But I thought if we could just listen to each of the participants talk about their children, it might give you a sense of what, uh, what, what these interviews are about. So if Chris, you just move to the next slide and click on that one, we can hear Damien talk about Bethany. She's almost 20 years old. She has a condition called Drave syndrome, yeah. D-R-A-V-E-T. Um, there are a number of different elements to that. Um, she has difficult to control uh, epileptic seizures. Uh, the, I guess the other main part of it is uh, intellectual disability. And for her, that's on the profound end yeah. of the scale. That's not always the case with Drave no, syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, ranges from very mild intellectual disability to profound. There's a profound end of that. She... And then if we just move on to the next slide, we can quickly hear um, Jane Tracy talk about uh, yeah, her... Yes. Thanks. Uh, her son, Nick. Um, Nick has... Uh, well, Nick's a really fun bloke to be around. Lots of joy in the moment. Lots of helping me stay focused on being present, yeah. um, has tremendous just fun and, and, and joy in his life. I've just been um, 
with him this morning trying out a new walker with the physio and just the fun he has playing jokes with us and heading off down the road when we want him to go in one direction <laughs> has everybody laughing and it's it's he's, he's great fun to be with yeah. he has an intellectual disability and cerebral palsy and epilepsy yeah great uh, so that was jane talking about her son nick and what I would like to convey in these, the, convey in this presentation is these interviews were really strong interviews. They talked eloquently about their children and they talked with great openness and honesty and provided a, a whole heap of detail. And anyone who's ever done qualitative research or qualitative interviews will know that interviews don't always go this way. And I've had interviews that have been stilted conversations that have never led anywhere. But if there's any problems with the chapter or this presentation, it's not their problem, it's my problem. So if we go to the next slide, one um, of the things that I was really trying to do in these interviews was to get uh, the participants of the interview to talk about when the concept of the NDIS became something that they were thinking about. And today, Damien Palmer can talk about all the pertinent dates around the introduction of the rollout of the NDIS in Australia. And he knows when the Productivity Commission handed down its first major report, and he knows what's in the report. And he knows when the NDIS uh, legislation passed. But at the time, he was more vague about what was happening with the NDIS and what it would mean. And he said, I follow federal politics reasonably closely, but I don't have a clear memory of the NDIS and the steps it went through at the time. I remember thinking that it was there and that this could be really good in terms of decent funding for disability service services and a more coherent overall service provision. And it's not surprising that Damien was not entirely on top of what was going on as how, as, as how he put it at the time, because him and his family were going through a really difficult time. At some stage, uh, at some point, Bethany simply stopped eating and Damien and his, uh, his, and, the, and his wife, Christine, had no idea why she stopped eating, but they talked about, he talked about how for a while there, they just watched her feeding away and eventually uh, Bethany ended up in hospital and she had to have a feeding tube inserted into her stomach and it was a really difficult time for the whole family and it was only after Bethany came out of hospital and and start and she and she started to improve that Damien had turned his attention to the NDIS and by then it had been legislated and it was some point after that that he really started paying attention um, and so it was in 2016 that he went to a couple of information sessions to get a sense of what was going to be involved and then as he tends to do when something captures his interest he started to explore the bigger picture side of things and he really started reading deeply into the uh, the subject and that's when he read the productivity commission report and looked at the legislation and then he started reading uh, disability liter literature so obviously he landed on uh, some of chris's articles along the process uh, along the way and so by now Damien was optimistic about the scheme and he had a reasonable understanding of how it should work. And the next step for him was to sit back and wait for that call from the NDIA. If we go to the next slide, Chris. Jane Tracy was involved with the NDIS at a much earlier, earlier stage. So Jane Tracy was a GP working in a family general practice when Nick was born. And when Nick started attending uh, primary school, she started to look for uh, part-time work and she really wanted to combine, by that stage, she really wanted to combine this medical experience that she had with a renewed or a new interest in intellectual disability. So she started looking for jobs that would combine those two interests. And she ended up at the Centre for De Developmental Disability Health at Monash University. And eventually she rose to become director of that centre. And I'm sure it was her experience in these two fields that would have appealed to Mary Woolbridge, Minister for, the Minister for Community Services Victoria, when she asked Jane to be on the Victorian NDIS task force. And this task force, which became known as the NDIS Implementation Committee, was formed in 2011. And by her own account, Jane talks about how she was very involved in the NDIS from that point on. And Jane thought, the ND, NDIS was a fantastic idea. And she recalled thinking in broad terms about what the NDA, NDIS might achieve. And one of her main hopes was that the NDIS might address what she referred to as this inequity around how you got your disability. So she was distressed that someone who had a brain injury from a car accident had money that went 
to them through the Transport Accident Commission. But for somebody like Nick, there was nothing except Medicare. So that was one of the issues that concerned her. And another issue that she was really interested in was the commitment of the NDIS to building capacity in community services. So Jane was really excited about the opportunities that might emerge in services for people with disabilities if the NDIS did indeed start to focus on that capacity building side of things. And she hoped that this might ultimately contribute to, a, to building a more inclusive community overall. So if we go to the next slide, Chris. Um, neither Nick nor Bethany were required to establish eligibility for the, uh, for the NDIS. So their first interactions with the NDIS were around planning. And as we know, there's a number of plans, a number of elements involved in uh, preparing an NDIS plan. It needs to conform to certain principles, including so far as possible that a plan be individualized and be directed by the participant. And a crucial part of this process, of course, is the statement of goals also needs to be prepared by that participant. So the statement of goals covers and aspirations covers a person's, um, it also covers a person's environmental context, uh, personal environmental context, such as living arrangements, and family and community su supports, and the, ex the extent of their social and economic participation. And some scholars, inc including, including my boss, Chris Bigby, has, have pointed out that these individualized funding schemes that elevate the importance of market models of service deliver delivery rely on participants in such schemes to be discerning consumers. So they need to be consumers who can exercise choice and control and make important decisions about their own lives. And this means that there are assumptions embedded in these schemes about self-direction and about decision-making capacity. And these assumptions are already problematic, problematic for some people with intellectual disabilities. And they're even more problematic for people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. And the problem can really be summed up in a question that Damien Palmer has asked himself on a number of occasions. How do you set goals if you cannot articulate them? And whenever Damien raised the, that issue at NDIS training sessions, the advice he received was almost always the same. As Bethany's informal carers, he and his wife Christine would have to complete the planning process for Bethany, but they would have to do it in a way that made it appear as if Bethany had completed it herself. So Damien was really put out by this experience and he's written elsewhere that I see the, the embrace of goals in this case as an act of exclusion of both Bethany as a person with a profound intellectual disability and of myself as one of her informal carers. So Damien believed that on some level, the NDIS and its insistence that Bethany's plan contain a statement of goals represented a failure of the scheme to accept her for who she is. And that's to say someone unable to conceive of or to articulate such goals. And on another level, I would suggest that this can be understood as a flaw in a scheme that is so committed to regarding all participants as members of a homogenous group, and in this case, that's people with disability, without really taking into account the specific impairment group to which they also belong. And Damien did, of course, fill in the forms on Bethany's behalf. He had no choice, and he was just working within the system, as he put it, in order to get the best results he could for Bethany and for his family. And, if, and the quote that I've got up here just sort of goes to that uncomfortable, uncomfortable feeling he had about filling in the forms on Bethany's behalf. So if we could just go to the next slide, Chris. Are you there, Chris? Yeah, is that it? Oh yes, yeah, thanks, I didn't even notice it. Um, Jane Tracy didn't have the same concerns as Damon Palmer about filling in Nick's statement of goals, but she did think long and hard about the, the process. And she thought about what would be good for him in terms of friends and in terms of communication and in terms of independent mobility. And she thought about what kinds of things she wanted for him to have in the place that he lived. And she also thought about ways of giving him choice and how, how he could make choices and, and how he could feel in control of his life. So she thought a lot about the importance of, about having something for him to look forward to. And then she filled in the goals accordingly. And she said of the, pro the process and the goal setting phase, it helped me crystallize my knowledge of Nick into a written document that I found very, I took a long time to do it. And it was really good because I think 
I kind of felt, well, I can die now. I've put all this stuff down. My vision for Nick is now written down and other people could take it and run with it instead of it being all in my head. So that was really helpful. Um, if we could just go to the next slide, Chris. Thanks. Um, so because there are no strict guidelines about how to support a person with severe intellectual disability, uh, during that planning phase, Jane and Damien were both left to navigate their own quite different paths through the process. But despite adopting quite different approaches, each achieved relatively good outcomes for their children. And one of the reasons for this is that they're both really strong and really willing advocates. And this begs another no less important question, and that's this. And it's a question that scholars are starting to ask about the NDIS. And, and the question is, what occurs when there is no strong parent or advocate to act on behalf of a, a participant seeking to gain access to the NDIS. So if good outcomes for people with intellectual disabilities in individualized funding schemes are dependent on strong advocacy, then it suggests this more systemic problem that could ultimately lead to poorer outcomes for people without strong advocates. And Damien and Jane both acknowledge this issue in their own way. Damien talked about how being a persistent advocate for Bethany meant that some people at the NDIA tended to view him as this troublemaker. He wasn't afraid to challenge those he interacted with at the NDIA and tell them how he thought this scheme was meant to be working. And he wasn't afraid to keep pushing where others might hold back or stop. But he expressed concern for those who for various reasons could, could not or would not advocate strongly for their children. And Jane made a similar point. Jane was convinced that those people on the NDIS who were doing okay were those who have a parent working full time on the NDIS, because ultimately the system is so hard to manage, that's what she said. And she also acknowledged that her own privileged position gave her an advantage in a system that can be, that rewarded strong advocates. English is my first language, she said. I've got education. I can advocate. People who don't have any of that are much worse off. If we could just move to the next slide, Chris, that would be great. So like many participants, Jane's experiences of, of that NDIS planning process was fraught with some errors and missteps and many frustrating moments. And she sort of uh, talked about that. By, she, she said we had some problems. And then she moved off on to recount one excruciating story about making 30 phone calls in order to have Nick's in-shoe orthotics replaced. But for her, a real key issue was that administrative burden placed on parents uh, in managing the NDIS. And she talked eloquently really about the general exhaustion that occurred from having, having to jump through so many hoops. And she said, something, she said something along the lines of, that's the tiring, exhausting bit. I'm tired of it. And then she went on to explain how the only way she could properly manage Nick's NDIS plan was to take a step back from her own work. I'm stepping down from my own position to reduce my hours of work so I can work out the NDIS. So it was that administrative side of things that was really difficult for Jane. And Damien was even more distressed when he saw Bethany's approved plan because the plan was littered with a number of glaring errors and also some inappropriate om omissions. And he was also disappointed that he never got to see a draft of Bethany's plan before it was approved. But the NDIA had abandoned the practice of sharing a draft of the plan with participants in the middle of 2016. And they only reinstituted that again earlier this year, I think. So the, ma the mistakes in Bethany's plan ranged from comical to pretty serious. So for one thing, the NDIA couldn't quite, couldn't get the name of Bethany's parents right. So Christine Palmer, Bethany's mother, was named as Samantha Palmer in that first plan. And it was a mistake that could only be corrected after a, a lot of work on Damien's behalf. I think it ended up in a, sh a scheduled review. That was might have been the only way he could get it changed. But other omissions were more serious. Damien and Christine had put in this extraordinary amount of effort to, into thinking about Bethany's statement of supports. And they'd written lists of everything Bethany needed and calculated the costs of each item. But the plan didn't really reflect any of that work at all. And for just one example was that there was no funding in Bethany's plan for tube feeding whatsoever, even though Damien had made it really clear in that first meeting with the local area coordinator that Bethany required tube feeding. Um, 
And it's easy to talk about the problems of this unwieldy uh, scheme, but I, it's, it's, but I don't want this presentation to turn into some pile on onto the MDIS because, and one of the reasons for that is because Damien and Jane both made the point on a number of occasions that their views on the NDIS remained quite positive. So if we could just move to the next slide, Chris. Um, and each offered concrete examples of how the NDIS was working really well for their child. So for one thing, Damien considered that shift of having the resources allocated to Bethany as a really fundamental development that allowed him and his wife to make decisions about where to spend those resources. So that development, that development had allowed him to get a feel for assisting Bethany exercise choice and control, he said. And, a and that was especially in terms of the services that Bethany could now access. And another important, posit another important positive aspect of the NDIS for Bethany was that insurance element of the scheme. And this was especially in regards to the area of early intervention and assistive technology. So Damien explained how this was probably one of the areas where his interaction with the agency on the issue of planning had worked really well. And that's because it had worked exactly how it should work. So all of Bethany's requests for funding for ankle supports and hydrotherapy and other capacity building measures had been properly funded. And Damien acknowledged that these measures were essential because they contributed to Bethany maintaining that ability to walk. And if she lost the ability to walk, then down the track, the expenses, the funding uh, expenses would be much more onerous. Nick's first plan is a really interesting one. So it appears that Nick's more tailored individualized uh, plan represented a challenge that the market could not quite rise to meet. So essentially what Jane wanted was a support worker who was part of his staffing team, both at the house and at his day activities to work regularly with Nick to learn about his methods of communication. So this would have involved getting to know Nick and also getting to know how to use and program his communication app. And Jane's reasoning for such an approach was pretty clear. You can't support Nick without being able to communicate with him. And I would say that because Jane had a really good understanding of the NDIS, she put together this really good, innovative, uh, visionary plan. But the only problem was she couldn't get the plan to work. And she said, I couldn't bring the vision of life and make it Nick's... I couldn't bring the vision to life and make it Nick's reality. And so in that first year, they grossly underspent because they couldn't get that one-to-one -one support. So even though there were provisions in his plan, for support, the Department of Human and Social Services, which managed Nick's house at the time, could not work out a way to employ staff at the house to do some of that one-on-one -on -one stuff around communication. And Jane was really understanding. She said it was probably just a systems, th systems thing, which I think is true enough. But it's also another example of the problems that many people with intellectual disabilities have experienced in translating their plans into action. So the outcome of all of that for Nick was that they dramatically underspent in that first year. And Jane was really concerned coming into their second planning meeting that the funding would be cut due to underspending. But it's a testament to her advocacy skills that the, they received the same amount of funding the second year. And they did eventually manage to spend that, spend that money on what it had been designed for. Um, so taking a step back, I will get to the conclusion slide in a second, Chris, but taking a step back, both, both individuals do view the NDIS quite positively and they have hope for the future. Jane, like many parents, is concerned that, about what will happen to her child after she dies, and she, but she still hopes that the NDIS will be operating well enough to give, them, give him a reasonable the reasonable and necessary supports that he needs to live a decent life. And she believes that in five or 10 years times that things will improve and that, and she's also convinced, convinced about the importance of the NDIS. She appreciated how, appreciated how the NDIS was founded on notions of individual rights rather than that wealth, uh, rather than welfare. And also on the way that the insurance model focused so much on optimizing people's participation, contribution and inclusion. And despite his more problematic experiences with the NDIS, Damien still has hopes that the scheme can work. 
And so he said, most of my interactions with the NDIA itself had been way, way below what they should have been. But he also said, while engaging with service providers hadn't been all smooth sailing either, he still believed that everyone was doing their best to make things work. So after four years of navigating the scheme, he still remains optimistic, even if there's still a lot of work to do is how he put it. So if we go to the conclusion now, I thought with this, the conclusion, we might just take a step back and look at what Prime Minister Julia Gillard said in November 2012, when she moved to second reading of the National Disability Insurance Bill in the House of Representatives. So in her speech that day, Gillard declared that the NDIS represented a transformational approach to the provision of disability services in Australia. We will build a new system from the ground up, she said, and it will respond to each individual's goals and aspirations for their lifetime, affording certainty and peace of mind for people with disability and their carers alike. So more than seven years have passed since Julia Gillard made her speech and this presentation has sought to assess whether that scheme, whether the scheme is living up to some of those ideals that she expressed that day. And of course, this is on, it's only an exploration of the experience of two NDIS participants, but I would suggest it remains a worthy exercise because it's through the accumulation of these stories that we, can, that we begin to understand the complexity and also the variety of what is ultimately a fractured experience of the NDIS in Australia. So some scholars and advocates have begun to argue that the NDIS is failing to take into account some of the unique needs associated with having an intellectual disability. And I think that the experiences recounted here by Damien Palmer and Jane Tracy would suggest that those assertions are correct. While Jane and Damien recounted quite different stories, each in their own way acknowledged that a more nuanced understanding of people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities, and also what the ex exercise of rights looks like for them, is integ integral if the NDIS is to properly accommodate them in the scheme. And even though Damien and Jane both recognised the benefits that their own children had derived from the NDIS, both were still concerned about equity about what happens for those people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities whose parents are not around or not well educated or not particularly articulate advocates. Even so, despite such reservations, the optimism of Julia Gillard's 2012 speech can still be discerned in the way that both of these informants talk about the NDIS today. Each tended to view the NDIS as this ongoing process and both thought it a better system than the one that it re had replaced. And they also acknowledged that building a new system from the ground up is a fraught process that can take some time. After all, the transformation, if we may call it that, of the Wild West in the USA took more than 30 years. Thank you. And we've just got the references there now. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, David. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. So I'm going to clap and I think that the 55 other people that are listening will also clap too. Thank you. That was a fantastic exposition of that piece of work. Um, Jacinta's clapping as well. So we've got some time less, left from questions. Um, and there's a comment here from somebody who, who's anonymous who says, Damien's words of authenticity of voice and goals really resonates with me. How do you think we can influence the NDIS to understand the nuance, not subtle, of complexity of voice when they are so married to what's your goal uh, rhetoric, uh, including writing in the first person when, um, when that's difficult? It seems that profound intellectual disability is unpalatable to them. That's a big question, David. And it's one that I would love for you to answer if possible, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's fair. I, I don't think, I, I mean, I don't think there's any simple answers. And I think David's sort of, David's presentation has really explained how complex and nuanced it is, um, both to be somebody with a profound and intellectual disability, but also to be a parent of somebody um, and to be asked to represent them. Because clearly that representation depends on on your understanding of that person, but also your understanding of their place in the world. 
And I think some parents, uh, some parents strive for their, their person with a disability to be, to have a significant place in the world that's valued by other people. For example, having a job, having friends, but others strive, I think like Damien in many ways, just to value the person as a person irrespective of the fact that they might be able to participate in economic things or not. And I think that's part of what Damien is arguing, that having goals, having employment may not be something that somebody needs to strive for. So I think it's recognising that enormous diversity and not putting on a layer of this is what we expect you to be and this is what we expect a life to be like. And that's a really challenging thing, I think, for any scheme that's trying to deal with hundreds of people. But on the other hand, there's very, there's actually a relatively small number of people um, that do have severe and profound intellectual disability. It's not a huge group. Um, and I think paying particular attention to that group of people, having a reference group uh, involving parents uh, and other people who know them well, uh, in thinking about the best way to respond to that group um, might be one way forward. And I think at the moment they've been particularly invisible. Um, I remember one of the PhD students at the last ACID conference sort of saying that she felt that the people, the planners that she talked to just didn't understand the fact that her daughter had a profound intellectual disability and you couldn't just put her on the phone. So getting over that misunderstanding, I think, is, is the first step of the hurdle. Um, do you want to add anything to that, David? No, but I did notice that Damien Palmer is on the Q&A and he says, I couldn't have put it better myself. So I'm glad that uh, that's the case. <laughs> so the next question comes from uh, one of our students. She says, thank you for your presentation. Your findings resonate very much with my experiences of supporting participants and parents trying to navigate a very complex and confusing scheme. Too many incorrect assumptions made by the NDIS. Um, I think that's more a statement. Do you want to add anything to that, David? Um, yeah, I've, yeah I, think, I think that what comes out of this is it just takes so much time to sit down with and talk to uh, someone about these issues and and then i mean the the, the chapter that I've, the, the chapter that i've written goes into some of the reasons why uh damien's particularly damien's plan uh that he organized for bethany didn't really match uh with uh his meeting at all and one of the reasons was that the, the planning process was really it was in in its infancy and there was a really some issues about um, how they were collecting data. I can't go into that. But eventually, when the chapter comes out, it will be there. But yeah, there are lots of assumptions made, and it's a lot of it can. Be, uh, I'm getting lost, Chris. Sorry, I've I've lost I've lost my train of thought. That's okay. I can't work out what it was, so I'll, we'll, yeah. we'll just move on. <laughs> um, so. Uh, Tarina says, thank you, David. Um, it highlights the dichotomy between an insurance scheme attempting to be person-centred. Um, do you have any comments around that? Can, can you answer some of these for me, Chris? That seems a bit <laughs> I think I think that I think what she's alluding to is the tension between an insurance scheme which is actually which is based on on early intervention and sort of lifetime support and minimizing the value, the cost of supporting somebody um, compared to a scheme that is completely person centered and that provides the best possible support for somebody and that there's attention there. But I think part of the story of uh, particularly um, Jane's story in relation to her son and, and Damien's that early intervention, good support when somebody is a younger adult will actually stand the person in good stead in the long term. And, and investing in that may reduce their dependency, their impairment levels, you know, as they get older. So there is, there is something to be said for having an eye to, to, to the future and, and giving somebody as much support as possible. Um, I think just going back to the other question, 
I think one of the issues is that one of the aims of the NDIS was actually to increase economic participation of people with, in, with disabilities, but also of carers. And I think what we can see is some of the contradictions there, particularly for, for, well, for Jane in having to give up work or to go part time because it is so burdensome to manage um, to get the best out of it. And I think that's what a lot of parents sort of are suggesting that, that it's, it's becoming a full time job for them to get the best out of it and to manage the costs and, and juggling all of those services. But it gives them more control and they get better outcomes for their son or daughter, but it's undermining the sort of economic outcomes that was hoped from the scheme. Um, there's a question from Jennifer or a comment from Jennifer, Clegg, who's in the UK. Uh, she says, your comments on the NDIS being built as it proceeded reminds me of a mother in the UK who complained social inclusion in schools had been a huge untried social experiment from which her son, who also has autism, suffered significantly. Do you think the changes in the provision of support for, inter in for people with intellectual disabilities is often being implemented that way? So is it an experiment that's having some negative impact on people? Jeez. I, I, I don't know. I think both of, I think there was, there's the negative impact definitely if Damien had, both have had negative experiences, but they remain quite positive about what it can offer. So there's this disconnect between the reality of how it's working versus uh, what it's, what it potentially offers. And, and so for each of them, they know the system is better than it, if it starts working, it will be better than it was. But um, so I, I, I think that the, the positive outcomes are still still there for each of them. And they both are convinced that it's the right thing, but it is not quite working as, the, as it should yet. Does that make sense? Does that sort of answer that question? So there's a, there's a, there's still a very strong sense of optimism, isn't isn't there? I, I think, think I think in those two, uh, and 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 that's probably because they're both really strong advocates as well. If if they'd had worse outcomes, and it, yeah, despite all their problems, they advocated very well for their children, and they got what I would say were pretty good outcomes. And um, it, if if we get some more stories, as as you mentioned, we're going to try to. Uh, broaden this re piece of research and there, there might be I instances where there, there, there has been a more negative impact, but I don't think that applies to the, the two uh, informants here. And I think the, the, the early evaluation data from the NDIS suggests that although people with intellectual disabilities are faring relatively poorly compared to other participants, many people are getting more and better services than they had in the past. Mm. So it's, it's a relative issue, um, although there are some examples in some of the data, certainly that I presented a couple of weeks ago, where some people have fared worse because they haven't had strong advocates and they've been unable to articulate their needs and so mm. they have lost funding. So I think it's, it's very variable. Mm. Um, there's one from Hilary. Uh, she says, uh, thank you both speakers for illuminating the power of story. There seems to be generally a lack of understanding uh, of how communication is co-constructed. And yet that somehow seems to be politically incorrect. There are suggestions how we can, are there suggestions how we can change this perception that we may be stronger than I? Okay, so she's suggesting that that we need to recognise the co-construction of, of maybe people's lives as well as uh, communication. Uh, but there seems to be a sense that families or other people shouldn't be trying to speak or speak together with people with disabilities. It should be left to, the, to them to do the speaking. Do you have some comments about that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, well, I, I mean, that's what I touched on by, by, by going in just to, into some of the methodology that I talked about there. One of the issues I've, I've worked it, I think Hillary, Hillary Johnson knows, I've worked in uh, an, on another project that really focused on helping, uh, ass, facilitating people with uh, milder intellectual dis disabilities tell their own stories. And there's, it's a really productive process. And uh, Kate DeCruz talked about that 
uh, the benefits of that before. And when she was talking about uh, that narrative side of things, I was I became wistful for uh, that sort of methodology and research. But I don't think you can discount this research that you do with uh, parents of people with intellectual disability, uh, particularly severe and profound intellectual disabilities, because I do think to some extent they're experts in their children's lives and they've got expert knowledge and lived experience. And um, it's a way of, as I say, an imperfect way of accessing um, the a, a, a perspective of people with a severe and profound intellectual disability. It's imperfect and, and there are other ways that people have tried, but I don't think it's, I would defend this uh, approach. Does that have I answered that question at all? I don't know. <laughs> I think so. So co-constructing with people, with, with others who know the person really well, be it parents or other family members, hmm. um, or in fact, uh, provide, service providers who've worked with somebody for many years. I wonder if Kate, do you want to comment on that too? Yeah, I might. Thanks, Chris. Um, look, I, I agree. Um, I think it's really lovely that Hillary's made that comment. And it may be worth just noting that in the literature that I looked at around using personal narrative storytelling and brain injury, there were some beautiful examples of co-constructed narrative. So there were ways in which people were talking together, sometimes uh, audio recording, someone would, a uh, person with, with brain injury would audio record their experiences and then talk with a person about that audio, listen to it together and talk about it and then together create a written version. So there was, um, and also in story, uh, song making, uh, writing lyrics for songs, there were some beautiful co-constructed ways of helping and supporting people to express their experiences. So I think that um, it's really important that we're open-minded to all sorts of ways of doing co-construction because that maximises the engagement of, of many people who we might think are excluded from the process. Um, but it does require some really good intentional facilitation skills so that you are truly hearing each other's voice, I suppose. Thank you. Um, just one more, maybe two more. Um, there's a question which is interesting. Did parents talk about whether planners spent time with the person with severe and profound intellectual disability? Did planners even meet the person? I'm actually not too sure about that. Um, Damien might be able to answer that on the chat function because I'm pretty sure he's there. I, my, yeah, I actually can't answer that question. I, I think I suspect that both Damien and Jane would have insisted that they, they took the person their son or daughter with them mm. to the planning meeting. Um, but we'll wait and see. There's yeah. one, one quite long question it says, I work with people with intellectual disability who don't have family members in their lives or other strong advocates. So I think they're worse off under individual funding models such as the NDIS. Services are fragmented and tertiary level services such as staff training and capacity building and subsequent building of quality culture has been lost. I acknowledge that many are better off under the NDIS, but I grieve for what has been lost, e.g. all the fantastic person-centred planning work. NDIS has not consulted and learnt from the parts of the old disability system that were working well. Do you want to say anything or is that more of a statement? Can we, can we keep that as a statement? I, or do you, do, you, do you want to address that one? <laughs> Um, I think that's a, I think that's a whole other presentation about what my, I, I don't think there's any question that some people haven't done as well, particularly people who don't have strong family members. And we know there's a lot of those people. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to unpack and maybe whoever made that comment might want to talk to us some more. You know, what was good about the old system that's been lost? Mm. And I guess my comment would be, you know, if you look back at the legislation back to 1986, planning, general service planning, individual program planning has been embedded in every piece of legislation up until the NDIS. And we haven't, I don't think we've done it well ever. Um, and I think there's a question there about how does government um, do individualized planning well? Um, and, and yeah, I think that's a big unanswered question. So maybe we could talk some more about that another time. Um, there's one more question. Oh, Damien says it would have been possible for us to have plan. It would have been possible for us to have planning meetings without Bethany present, 
Um, but as Chris suggested, we insist on taking with her. Um, I think we, we probably do need to stop there, but there's just a comment from Jennifer and I was going to mention it too. Jennifer says that Michelle King's research and she's a parent of, uh, she's a PhD student. She's also a parent of a young woman with profound intellectual disabilities is uh, just out in the last edition or it's on, it's early online of the Journal of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And, and she, in that paper, she talks about how the planner found that her profoundly intellectually disabled daughter's tapping was ir irritating and could she get her to stop. Um, so I think, I think that sort of sums up, I guess, the lack of real understanding within the NDIS planners around this group of people. I should just mention too, there is a, a whole special issue or, or a special section of the Journal of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities coming out around the, the, the concept of de-differentiation. And one of the other papers in it is by a Swedish author um, who uses the concept of as if, um, and I think that comes up a lot in your presentation, David, the sense of we regard people as if uh, they can speak or as if they can make choices on their own and things. It's, it's a really interesting concept. Anyway, I think we have to draw it to a close. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming and for bearing with us. And we will try and build a foul safe mechanism into um, things for next time so that we, if we make a mistake with the link, there's a there's a backup. So the next seminar is on the second Wednesday of September at the same time from three to five. And it's a really interesting seminar. So we have a guest speaker, um, Alan Hoff, who is a, um, who's, has a PhD in, in governance, uh, but he's also well known as a consultant across the sector around issues of both governance and regulation. So he's going to talk about regulation within the NDIS. And our very own uh, PhD student, Jade McEwen, who is also a practitioner, a very experienced quality practitioner, is going to talk about some of the work from her PhD about the perceptions that frontline staff and managers have around quality and some of the, the disconnections in some of their perceptions um, and how that maps onto uh, the audit system and, and the regulatory system that we have for the NDIS. So it should be a really interesting session next time. So we look forward to seeing you. There was a, there was a recording of this and the slides and the link to the recording will be available on our site. So thank you very much for coming and good afternoon. <laughs>